I'm very excited to welcome back an amazing handicapper and great friend of the show. You've heard him on many sports radio broadcasts and podcasts across the country. You can find some of his work at VegasInsider.com and MajorWager.com. Very happy to bring back Mr. Brian Edwards from Major Wager and Vegas Insider. You can follow Brian at Vegas B. Edwards. Brian, I, it, dude, 30 days, man. We're, we're about 30 days until a few games, college football. What's been happening? Oh, not much, man. Um, great, great to be on with you. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I you know, I retired from baseball a while back, so I've been a uh, little, little, little bored here lately. But I mean, you know, getting my uh, prep in for football and uh, getting ready to turn that into high gear because you're right, it, it is getting pretty close. Oh, absolutely, it's sneaking around, you know. I and you know, retiring from baseball, it's kind of like. Gives you some more time, I guess, to dive into football. So that's that works for you, I think, a little bit while you're out there at the pool working on your tan. Just uh, bust out a magazine and read up a little bit. That sounds good. You know, why not? Summertime, right? Right. Uh, but, Absolutely. man, there's, I'm excited. And I know that there's some games on week zero. Uh, but, you know, right now I am almost done with all my prep. I'm uh, probably I'm, I'm on the uh, Sun Belt right now. The last one, I, well, I guess the pack two, I, I still got to do the pack two and a couple independents, but uh, I'm almost done myself, but I did the SEC the, over the weekend so I could uh, have this fun little show with you and uh, see where we align and maybe disalign, but uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, and I always like to start with just some questions and a general question I have for you is who benefited more from conference realignments, the SEC I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to bring the ACC in the Big Twelve because it's not about them. It's about the SEC and the Big Ten. Who benefited more between those two big conferences? Oh, okay. I was prepared to answer that question with uh, Utah, K State, and Oklahoma State because no, okay, uh, okay, then in Oklahoma and the Big Twelve. Uh, but in terms of uh, SEC and Big Ten, um, hmm. I don't know really who benefits SEC wise, because um, it just got tougher, you know. Um, I guess big, from a team perspective, I, I'm I'm going to ask from a conference perspective because they're bringing in money, um, right? They're bringing in strength from a strength and money perspective, right. let's say. Right. Well, you know, from you know, Texas uh, brings in a lot of a lot of money and. You know, SEC already had a, a little bit of footprint in Texas with, you know, A&M. But, you know, Texas and Oklahoma, um, that's a good addition for the SEC. But then at the same time, you know, Big Ten, now you're in the Los Angeles market. Um, you know, now you're a factor in the Northwest. Um, but I, I would think the L.A. market is the biggest uh, thing for them. And... Uh, but really, I, I just think it's the like middle tier te teams of the Big Twelve. If we're, if we're talking just specific schools, and we're not, I know you're talking conference. But like, you know, now Kansas State and Oklahoma State have great opportunities, you know, to get to the playoff, or or at least much better opportunities uh, than they would have had otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got to win that conference, but that's so true. I mean, I guess they benefited from getting rid of them, and I haven't really thought of that. But, but just between the SEC and the Big Ten, I think the SEC probably benefited a little bit more in power, but the Big Ten probably benefited a little bit more in coverage, you know, for money. Right. I just think getting those four Western teams really stretches things out for the Big Ten and I almost feel like maybe the SEC should have attacked a couple of those schools themselves, because I think when if I really look to the future, they're just going to look for the most money possible and the biggest coverage and TV deals possible. And that's really what it's about. Now, I think the SEC is still ahead of the Big Ten in strength, and most people would agree with that. Uh, the Big Ten still, you know, you, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, you can throw Oregon in there at least for this year. USC's kind of been eh, an afterthought the last 10 years. But, um, you know, as far as strength, the SEC coverage big time, I think that's probably fair. Uh, I still think the SEC is probably going to have the most teams representing in the playoffs. So we'll find that out. 
obviously, uh, at the end here. But in lieu of all these changes, Brian, are you approaching this season differently from a betting perspective than in the past, or are you still kind of keeping your same process, uh, thoughts, and actions? Well, you know, I'm always looking for advantageous, you know, spots. And I think with the Big Ten, now you're really getting those with what the four teams from out west are having to do travel wise. And on that note, I think your alma mater um, might have the best situational spot in all of college football this year uh, when they get two weeks to prepare uh, for Oregon's. Uh, trip to Camp Randall when Oregon is going to be, you know, coming off of that, or actually it'll be their third trip to the East coast in a five week stretch. And when they're at home to Maryland the week before Maryland gets two weeks to prepare just as Wisconsin gets two weeks to prepare and mid November in Madison, I would imagine will be quite chilly. I hope it the freaking storms, my friend. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> I'll take you I'll, do. I'll take a cold rain or snowstorm or something mid November type thing to uh make it hurt a little bit more when those uh ducks get hit. Maybe a little bit of wind to 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 flutter that passing game, but the truth is is that it's hard to know what to expect from Wisconsin because Phil Longo is there and he's kind of bringing his version of the air raid in yet they still ran the ball like ranking in the sixties, but it, it's just, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know what to expect. I, I think the Tyler Van Dyke thing is a very, it, it's almost like how, how you might've felt when Graham Mertz came to there. I'm not super excited about Van Dyke. You know, he had a good first year and then a bad couple years. It, I almost feel like our schools are almost in the same situation. We'll get to Graham Mertz by the way since we're doing mostly SEC, but you're right. It's like different preparation for them. For me, for a betting perspective, I have less bets. I, I, I you know, peppered a lot of bets before, but I, I will say that from a season win total perspective, I have less bets, but I'm actually going a little bit more to the long, a couple, a couple long shots that I like, you know, some pizza money here, maybe a half unit here. And the reason that is, is because I think the transfer portal made things so much up in the air. You don't know who's going to develop well. And I think that it's just going to bring those like other schools that have the longer shots, especially in the uh, group of five conferences to actually have a better chance to get into the championship game where you can start hedging, you know? So that's my perspective. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm so stoked that now the little guy has, you know, such a better, or, I mean, we're going to have at least one of the little guys in there uh year in and year out now. So, um, yeah, the Boise State's the world, the Memphis Tigers of the world, et cetera. Um, yeah, and I mean, look, I mean, Boise State during Chris Peterson's tenure was awfully close to getting in there a couple of times, uh, really close during Kellen Moore's uh, four-year um, spectacular run at quarterback uh, in Boise. Uh, so yeah, so that I'm looking forward to the little guy being in there and just fired up for the 12 team playoff just in general. But then, you know, look for us, more games, more bets, more fun. More fun is what we're talking about. Absolutely. It's going to be more fun, more games and a better chance to make it. Now I, you know, some of those years that Wisconsin was a top six, top eight team, they make it in the playoffs. So that's kind of the exciting thing for some of us, but what's the bad thing, Wisconsin. And I've mentioned this many bef times before in the show. Now it's harder for them to get to the Big Ten Championship game because it's all spread out. It was like all you had to do was beat Iowa a couple times, you know, and uh, and then you're at least have that shot, which they seem to falter most of the time. A couple times they've won, but now it's it, it, they they're still going to have to do so good, and they're going to have to see Ohio State, Penn State, Oregon, USC, Washington, uh, UCLA if they're ever good again. You know, they're going to see those teams a lot more too. So it's going to be certainly interesting. If I'm Indiana, I freaking love it, man. I, I'm like, yeah, you know, now I, there's going to be years I'm not going to be facing Ohio State and Penn State. You know, it's great for Rutgers, Indiana, Maryland, you know, those schools that were just in the the doldrums, man, <laughs> in that division. It, it's so hard to get out of that. So I think it helps teams like that. And you can probably relate a little bit to the SEC with some of that as well. 
Well, let's talk some SEC, baby. Uh, start with, we'll start, you know, probably with one of the better teams and kind of work our way down. I, I maybe just briefly hit on every team. We have like, what, 16 teams now there? Uh, we have a lot more t- teams in the SEC, just like uh, we did in the Big Ten. But let's talk about them briefly and their outlook, how they correspond to their future number, season win total, or anything you want to talk about. Georgia. Georgia is the first one we got to talk about because, you know, they're pretty much number one in everybody's power ratings. They're number one in my power ratings preseason. Why would they be? You know, I thought they were right there with Michigan anyway last year, uh, even though they didn't make the playoffs because of a couple of uh, blunders against Alabama, but here we are, and uh, the Georgia Bulldogs have uh, a different schedule. They still have to play a tougher team now in Clemson, but what's your outlook for Georgia? Yeah, like you, I've got them number one uh, in my power rankings. Uh, obviously, one of the best uh, quarterbacks in the country, and obviously some of the best recruiting uh, in the country, if not the best, probably the best. Mm-hmm. Um right there with Alabama, but probably a little edge to Georgia in the last four or five years. And, um, yeah, I mean, they're loaded. Uh, they bring back 51 uh, Letterman. Uh, their transfer-specific uh, additions were ranked 15th nationally, but their recruiting class in the 2024 cycle was number one overall, five five-stars, 25 uh, four-stars coming in. Um, I'm not saying Phil Seals' national u- unit rankings are the end-all, be-all, but uh, if they're remotely close this year, uh, this is how nasty George will be. He's got them number two at quarterback, number nine at running back, 16 at wide receiver, and that's the only position group that is outside of the top nine. Number one O-line, number seven D-line, number three linebacker, number three in the secondary, number three uh, special teams. Um they're loaded per usual. Now the schedule will be a lot different. You know, you got to go to Alabama, you got to go to Oxford, you got to go to Austin, um, and uh, and but like if there's one bet that I like uh, for Georgia, it's uh, minus fourteen or fewer against Clemson in Week One. I think that's an absolute gift, and I mean, I, and I think you can get it. Uh, Actually, I haven't looked in a, uh, a week or so, but uh, I think you get it at 13 or 13 and a half. But um, and I think the narrative coming out of week one, or the, at least the biggest national narrative coming out of week one, uh, will be that uh, Dabo Sweeney is an absolute buffoon and a knucklehead uh, <laughs> for not using the transfer portal like anyone with a brain is doing. I don't disagree with that. I, I mean, I think he should have filled a few holes at least and used it some. He still could preach right. like staying at your college and stuff like that. But he can say, look, I understand kids are going to have different circumstances where we're, we're going to be me- very meager in the transfer portal. So I don't want you guys were in, you know, we're developing you to be that positional player. Now, you know, we'll see how the transfer portal develops with NIL and everything. I personally think the sitting out a year should be something implemented, but there's also antitrust with that and all kind of even just throw it, it, they're so messed up with the laws and how they correlate to this right. stuff. It's just an absolute freaking mess. It, you can argue anything, but um, yeah, at Jordan number one, uh, I, you know, t- where they were at 29 or something in returning production. I never see that of a Georgia team. And that's pretty insane. 75% returns on offense, 61% on defense. I, I do say they will lose a game because they can, they can lose a game or two, and now they don't have to feel that pressure. They'll probably let down against somebody. It could be at Ole Miss, um, even though they uh, coming out of Florida the game, they have Ole Miss seven days later. That's going to be interesting. It could be versus Texas at home. I, I, I don't know where that's going to happen, even at Alabama, right? I, I, I have their three sure. possible losses at those three. I don't see them losing any yep. other games. Um, right. But, you know, I, I and- say they win 10 or 11. My, my number's 10 and a half, and – uh, I'm not, I'm actually not worried about their offense. I'm more, I'm more concerned about their defense than their offense. It's weird to say that. Yeah, and let's um, let's be absolutely clear on one thing. Um, Georgia is still Alabama's bitch. They're one and eight against them the last nine times. They just got their ass kicked by them last year, um, and they have to go to Tuscaloosa, uh, where they have not won since Matthew Stafford threw that touchdown pass in overtime in the corner in 2007. And, um, you know, 
Georgia can say whatever they want. They're still Alabama's bitch. They're one and eight against them the last nine times, and they can certainly lose that game. And uh, like you said, they can lose in Austin or Oxford. And um, yeah, there's that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we have agreement there. I mean, number one, the power rings. No worries about that. I mean, it, it, Georgia fans can't be mad at that. I have about 27 points better than the average team. I, that's where I like to start some of them, and they sometimes can move back up. I think they probably finished a little higher last year, but things come together. Uh, the next team that I have, believe it or not, to talk about is Texas. Uh, I think that Texas I, – I, I have Texas uh, higher than Alabama uh, for a few different reasons. Um, I, I think that Texas, uh, you know, kind of – they I probably feel pretty bad about that loss last year, you know, coming into uh, the playoffs. Uh, they, you know, they were the big favorite. Um, thank God I was on Washington. I saw something in Washington and Kalen DeBoer now is in the SEC, as you know, but uh, Texas ranking 36 in returning production, 73% on offense, 61% on defense. Their portal rankings was fourth and on net three. I use on net three because uh, uh, it's net portal rankings i like that they're a nice 1.4 net yards per play win totals 10.5 i also have them at about 10.5 wins um i have them about 24.5 points better than the average team even though they have a medium hard schedule you know it, they were this returned so many guys and obviously archie manning is uh sitting there behind quinn ewers licking his chops waiting for some time they did get some good transfers at uh the, the skill positions in the wide receivers and everything. And um, Isaiah Bolden right there from Alabama, Matthew Golden from Houston and Silas Bolden from Oregon state. I like those guys not too worried about the offense. I'm a little bit more worried about the defensive front, but I think this is my second best team right now. Um, I, I have them in Ohio state really close. So what, what about you? What, any outlook on Texas? Yeah, so I've got them uh, fourth in my power rankings. I've got Oregon two, Ohio State three, and Bama five. Um, I've got them going nine and zero with three swing games being uh, Oklahoma uh, at A and M, and I, I skipped over uh, Georgia at home. Um, but I I will say one thing. Um, I mean, I'm not that high on Arkansas this year. But Arkansas is always up for Texas. If Arkansas is catching double digits here, that's a great spot for Arkansas because they've got uh, two weeks to prepare and uh, and Texas doesn't. So uh, that's the kind of tricky spot. But I just don't think Arkansas has got enough firepower uh, to beat them. Um, but I don't think Texas I, I don't think Michigan's got enough for Texas unless they just like win the turnover battle by by three. You know, if they, they got to be like plus three in turnover margin, I think to win that, I think the the really only legit losables for Texas, you know, barring uh, an insane rash of injuries, obviously, uh, are Oklahoma, Georgia, and at a and I mean, I, I think at a and uh, you know, who knows with that rivalry, especially uh, in front of 100,000 and change. And, uh, and, you know, who knows? Maybe Texas will be in a situation where they know they can lose that and still get to the CFP, and therefore maybe you're not as focused, et cetera. So I'm definitely not penciling them in for a W. Uh, yet in that A&M game, I, I think most books with games of the year have them favored by uh, like four to five uh, in that one. But yeah, Texas is going to be uh, really good. And um, yep, yep, they're, they're strong everywhere. All right. Well, let's, and I don't disagree. I think there's no value there. Um, they're favorites to make the playoffs, right? right. So I, I'm going to go with the next team because I have them tied with Alabama myself but uh you know let's give them a little bit let's give Ole Miss a little bump here you know for once you know I like Ole Miss somewhat this year and you know I kind of wish I was a little bit earlier on Jackson Dart for the uh, Heisman um but this team ranking 23rd in returning production Lane Kiffin just returning some studs and they rank third once again just lynching other schools in the transfer portal 83% on offense 57% on defense you know, this defense was better last year. They, they weren't just like a, one of those Ole Miss teams that you, you know, remember that just would give up a ton of points. They ranked 34th in scoring, you know. So uh, I, I do like that. Um, this is also a uh, season win total is nine and a half. I have them at 10 wins. So I think they go over the nine and a half. I think their schedule it eases up a little bit too. 
Um, just their losses, I really don't have any. I have a push at LSU. I have a push against Oklahoma, a push against Georgia even. I think they're at home against Georgia. It's a tough spot for Georgia. And I have a push at Florida. You know, I, I'm not seeing, um, you know, Texas there. I, I, you know, I'm not seeing – uh, Alabama there. So, you know, I, I think this is a great year for Ole Miss to make the playoffs and uh, uh, continue Lane Kiffin's little journey there to a possible national championship, Brian. Yep, we're on absolutely the same page, and I love over nine and a half. Uh, at last look, FanDuel had it priced uh, minus 115. Actually, uh, I've been filling in my Phil Steel mag with all kind of notes uh, for a month now. It, it might have been several weeks ago. But, um, yeah, over nine and a half. Love that. I've been on Ole Misses over the last two years for winners. Now, obviously, it's a um, a big step up in the number. Um, I believe it was – I know it was seven and a half last year. I want to say it was seven and a half year before. Maybe it was even six and a half. But, anyway, cash both. And um, <clears throat> uh, the, I mean, number one – in the nation, transfer specific. Now, that's me going by 247 Sports Composite. I'm not sure about uh, on net three, but I'm glad you pointed that out. I'll check that out. Um, I love what they did in the portal. I mean, they really don't have uh, many weaknesses. Um, no, uh, let's see. One five-star out of the portal. They've beefed up both sides uh, of the ball in the trenches. I mean, look, they um, – they had their best defense in a long time last year. They only gave up 22.5 points per game. They bring back 10 starters, but this is how much talent they added in the portal is at least by what Phil Steele's got listed as the starters. And I know he talks to uh, all, at least all the coaches power for and, and most of all of them in the country. And, and I'm sure, you know, Kiffin's, you know, confirming uh, a lot of this depth chart he's got. They've got six transfers listed as, as ones when they had a good D last year and are bringing 10 starters back. And, you know, Walter Nolan uh, gives them a lot of beef on the D line. Princely human million uh, from Florida. They get juice Wells who, if, if healthy, you know, he was a first team all sec guy uh, two years ago, but was injured uh, for South Carolina last year. So, um, and look, I, I they, they lost um, obviously the stud running back Judkins got a big bag from Ohio state, but I loved what they did. Uh, in the portal, uh, that position they get Logan Diggs, a four-star transfer, uh, previous or last year at LSU and previously at Notre Dame. They get Henry Parrish, who's been at Miami the last two years, and they get a Miami o of Ohio transfer and Rashad Amos, uh, who rushed for uh, 1,075 yards in the MAC last year. I mean, at the receiver position, they're absolutely one of the top two or three uh, groups. I mean, Trey Harris. Now you add. Wells, Jordan Watkins is a guy that's been with them, you know, forever. 50, 53 catches, seven, four, 741 yards last year, three touchdowns. And I think Caden Prescorn is the best tight end in the country. And um, and the schedule works. And, and it's it's so, uh, I don't know what to call it, maybe for, just fortunate for M Missouri and Ole Miss, who are both in what, you know, are really huge seasons for them off of big years and bringing a lot back with a chance to, you know, have real big time breakout years with the 12 team uh, playoff. Um, you know, th their schedules work. I don't know how they drew such, you know, manageable schedules um, uh, with, you know, Texas and Oklahoma added to the mix, but I will say this now, uh, Missouri and Ole Miss, I think are the only two teams in the sec that if they go 10 and two, it's going to be real, real hairy, whether they get into the CFP or not. Uh, I think every other SEC team could go 10 and two and, 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 you know, feel confident they'll get in the CFP. I do not know about that with Ole Miss and Missouri, because if they lose their two toughest games, that means their best wins. I think for Ole Miss, it will be Oklahoma at home. And if it ends up being Missouri and, you know, they lose, uh, their two toughest, which are probably going to be at Alabama and at a and I mean, what would uh, Missouri, Missouri probably their best win would be against Oklahoma at home, just like Ole Miss. And so I don't know if that, but, but hey, Kiev, I'm hoping to thread the needle just perfectly. I've got Ole Misses over <laughs> nine and a half. I want them to go 10 and two and miss the CFP. And then I want the Florida Gators to hire 
the lane train. So I'm looking to thread the needle perfectly <laughs> with a 10 and two record for the rebels. Well, maybe you will, you know, um, I, I don't know. They'd have to throw a lot of mo money at the lane train to bring them out there. And, uh, I'm looking forward to getting to Florida with, with you here. Cause I have a few ideas about Florida too, but, uh, you know, I, the SEC, I think that what you said about Missouri is so interesting because I think that they could make the playoffs, you know, and I, I think I might've threw a few bucks on that. I'm trying to look back at some of the bets that I made here and I'm, I didn't see that I gave it out. So I'm kind of scratching my head why I wrote it down here. So we'll get to that. But uh, no, Ole Miss, it, their defense did improve. They had the fortunate schedule. You have no disagreement from me. But let's move to Bama here. Um, Ole Miss plus 600 to win the SEC championship, too. That's interesting. Um, let's get to Bama. You know, the Bama is, uh, you know, fourth favorite, actually, uh, behind Ole Miss. So I think I'm kind of right to have them pretty much power rated close or have Ole Miss, you know, edge in them. Now, I love Kalen DeBoer. Don't get me wrong. I think it was a fantastic hire. But going from the Pac-12 to the SEC, I think that's a big difference, you know. And I think he's just, you know, going to be filling in some big shoes. And I, I think it's going to be a little bit tougher hitting the ground running. I'm not a Jalen Milrow guy, really, man. I, I'm not. I, I think he's just one of those, <sighs> I'm not going to say Milton, but not like he, he's not that flashy Alabama quarterback that can score some points. You know, it feels like Joe Milton a little bit for Tennessee last year in a way, you know, I don't think I, he, he scrambles well. He's a big guy. He's a stud runner. You know, I think he's perfect for college football. I don't see a lot of future in him in the pros, but I think this Alabama team doesn't return a lot. And yeah, I know they got some transfers and a few other guys to fill some holes, but uh, I, I'm I'm under for Bama. I'm under their their uh, season win total at nine and a half. I think there's definitely losses on this schedule. They only rank 98th percent in or, or 98th in uh, returning production, 64 percent on offense, only 42 on defense. Their transfer portal rankings was like 66 on on net because they lost a lot of guys. They're not upping their NIL, NIL money. Their hard schedule. I'm seeing that Georgia could be a loss, even though they said that be, that's their kryptonite. I see at Tennessee a possible loss. I see the Missouri even a possible loss. At LSU is a possible loss. At Oklahoma is a possible loss. And don't forget about Auburn at the end. Auburn's going to play them tough either way. Hell, they could have a hiccup at my Badgers, man. Now, that would be wonderful if that happened for me. But, um, you know, it, it, this just doesn't feel like the same Bama. It's a honeymoon year for DePore. They don't return enough guys. Uh, I don't like Milrow. I'm going under nine and a half. I hear you. And, you know, that's interesting what you said about the on net three. So they take into account who you lost to the portal and who you gain, huh? Yes, that's correct. On, on okay. three, uh, transfer portal uh, rankings are, are, are a really good site. I like that. I, I'll have to go check that out. Now, uh, 247 Sports Composite only takes into account who you brought in, your imports via the portal. And they have Alabama ranked number three. It transfers specific group, but that does not what you, what we we're just talking about does not take into account who you lost via the portal, which they did, you know, Isaiah Bond, uh, other key players, uh, et cetera. And yeah, so when I look at Bama, I mean, I marked them seven and oh with five swing games. So like you were, and that was with them winning uh, at Wisconsin. Um, so, yeah, they've got a lot of losable games on this schedule. Uh, Georgia at Tennessee. Uh, Missouri at home, even though they're favored by eight and a half uh, in that at LSU at Oklahoma. And that's a difficult spot. Oklahoma uh, has two weeks to prepare for Bama, although Bama gets Mercer at home the week before. So they kind of <laughs> also uh, have a, a an open date. And, and like you said, you know, you never know uh, with the Iron Bowl. I believe they're favored in the 13, 14 range at most books and games uh, of the year. Uh, but um, look, I, I get. I get what you're saying about Milrow. He, he does struggle with the intermediate passes uh, for sure. Um, but Kalen DeBoer likes to do what his quarterbacks do best. And Milrow does throw a good deep ball. It's like if, he, if he's throwing like 30 yards or more downfield, he's, he's like great. And if he's throwing 15 yards or less, he's awful. But he can run it. Um, and as long as he's not coughing up fumbles like he did against Michigan – to uh, 
really hurt my bank account. Um, I, I I do like him all all in all, but I mean I get what you're saying. Um, he, he well here's the I, I, I throws. And I put yeah, and I put the rankings up. They lost two five stars, gained no five stars. They went four and four, lost four or four stars, gained four or four stars, then lost a bunch of three stars, like twenty four of them in game nine. Now you also have to understand that part of the reason is they're letting some of these guys go is because some of their uh, other recruits stepped up, right? I mean, these guys, um, it, it, you have to kind of read everything together. But still, I, it's one of those situations where they, I think there was holes to fill. But this is also Jalen Miro without Nick Saban and that offense. It's with Kalen DeBoer's offense, which is a little bit uh, of a faster pace offense, kind of like a, a spread shoot offense. You know, it, it, it's it's different for him. And I'm not sure how capable he's going to be this first year of this offense, I just, I, I see hiccups everywhere, my man. And so, you know, that, that's, that's my thoughts on that. Hey, give me that URL, uh, URL again. Is it I'll, on? I'll put it in the chat. I'll put it in the right. comments here. And so oh, okay. for anybody go. that wants it, it's right there. And yeah, go ahead and grab that. And, uh, you know, it's one I, I've been using. I, I started using it last year and I thought that it, uh, you know, kind of sum things up pretty good because you're right. The uh, 24-7 one, who I look at for the small, they only does power five for on net, but the 24-7 will, will show Bama as, uh, you know, very well in the transfer portal and the other one doesn't show it. Now, I don't know how up to date the numbers are. I know on net keeps up to date numbers. I feel like the uh, transfer portal for uh, 24 seven doesn't because you still look at like recruiting classes of guys that aren't even there for some of these teams. So if you want to dig deeper into that, that's up to you. But uh, you know, just going from on net uh, it, it definitely shows the difference there, which uh, I, I think is uh, going to factor in. So let's go to the next team. And that is Missouri. Let's talk about the tigers, Brian and Missouri. Yeah. Ooh, they were good last year, man. I, I enjoyed watching uh, this team. I thought that uh, Brady Cook just did a fantastic job. He had to get a lot of those final yards with his legs, but he did. Uh, you have uh, Eli Drinkwitz there trying to make a big case to get into the playoffs this year. What do you? What's your outlook on Missouri? Well, like like Ole Miss, I'm on their over, um, which I I got in early June at over nine and a half plus one twenty. Now. Anyone that wants to tell me I'm uh, buying high, uh, I, I'm not going to dispute that. Uh, I don't remember what their win total was last year, but I doubt it was more than six and a half. But um, it, it's all about the schedule. It is absolutely all about the schedule for me. Like I was saying, uh, Ole Miss and Missouri, I think of the only SEC teams, if they go 10 and two, uh, you know, they could be, they could be in trouble. Um, and, and by the way, I have write-ups on my overpick on Ole Miss and Missouri uh, on Major Wager. They're long. Uh, I think it's about 2,500 words on Missouri and around uh, 2,200 words on Ole Miss, talking about why I like these uh, teams to go over. But, I mean, you look at Mizzou, like their first four games all at home, um, two G5 teams in Murray State and Buffalo. Um, and then Boston College and Vandy, they should be favored by at least 14 in all all four of those games, if not 17 or more. And then where they're a four-point underdog at A&M, or at least they have been at DraftKings for most of the summer, um, that's a great spot for Missouri. Uh, they get two weeks to prepare for that game, uh, whereas A&M is going to be coming off that rivalry game uh, with Arkansas uh, in Arlington. And I like Missouri to go into College Station, win that outright. Then they've got at UMass, and then they've got Auburn at home. Auburn does have two weeks to prepare, but it is uh, in Columbia, Missouri. And then they go to Alabama. So uh, I think there's a decent chance Missouri could be undefeated going to Alabama, where they're an eight-and-a-half-point underdog in most uh, books games of the year. But then they get a great spot, two weeks to prepare. Uh, for Oklahoma, uh, which actually has a layup the week before with a home game against Maine. But um, look, I mean, when your road games, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but it, two 
road games they, they should be favored in, uh, of course, barring, you know, big-time injuries, especially to Brady Cook. Um, but at South Carolina and at Mississippi State, I think are wins. I think Arkansas at home uh, is a win. Now, obviously, they're going to miss Cody Schrader, but I thought they did a fantastic job in the portal at the running back position. Nate Noel is a guy with more than 3,000 career rushing yards uh, at App State. Uh, in fact, 3,074, 26 career starts. And then Marcus Carroll, man, this guy's is a between-the-tackles uh, beast. Uh, I believe he was second in the nation uh, in rushing yards last year, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, now he's a you know Georgia State Sunbelt competition. But I think they got two quality running backs. Luther Burden, I, I think it's the best wide receiver in the country. I think Theo Weiss and, and Dane Key at Kentucky are probably the most underrated receivers uh, in the SEC and beyond. Um, uh, in terms of O-line, Phil Seals National Unit Rankings got them ranked number 21 on the O-line. They, they did lose some defensive talent, and, and I'm you know a little concerned there. They also lost their uh, D.C., but all in all, um, the schedule works, and I think they're going to be dynamic offensively. Uh, once again, um, either eight or nine starters back on offense, depending on what magazine you're, you uh, you look at. And um, that was an offense that averaged uh, 32 and a half points per game last year. So I'm on Missouri over and Ole Miss over as well. Absolutely. It, you know, here's the thing. Missouri – just missing those big names, you know, Georgia, uh, Tennessee, Ole Miss, and Texas, that's massive. Yeah, yeah, sure. At Alabama, fine. I think the problem is at the end, South at South Carolina, at Mississippi State, they're going to have nothing better to do but spoil somebody's future. And maybe they're going to play a hardcore spoiler here. Arkansas, obviously, at home. Um, but I, here's the thing it's 16 to one or 18 to one to win the sec. I don't like that. Cause you're laying minus five, 600 with Georgia. Um, I make making the playoffs is only plus plus one seventy five. but to make the sec title game at DraftKings is six to one. So you can bet them just to make the title game at six to one. I think that's the route that I'm going to go instead. Um, you can even do that and Ole Miss, you know, feel pretty good about it. Uh, uh, Ole Miss to make the title game uh, is only plus 250, but it, that'll that'll wipe the loss out on the Missouri bet, or you can go a little bit more Ole Miss, so you can manage that a little bit. You know, it's, it's almost kind of like, you know, you're just predicting it's not going to be Georgia versus Texas. You know, that's what you're predicting right there. I doubt it's going to be Georgia versus Texas. It's going to be someone versus someone, probably Georgia in there. But that's, I think that's an interesting way of looking at it. And Texas does have a hell of a lot harder schedule than Missouri. This might come out to the very last game. Let's move to LSU then. And LSU is, you know, I, I was pretty impressed by them against Wisconsin in their title game with Nussmeyer. You know, I, I thought it was, I thought he was pretty good. Now they did lose a lot of guys, especially neighbors and and Brian Thomas. I almost think Brian Thomas was the better receiver. You know, I mean, hey, neighbors and Thomas are both really nasty and they're both going to be really good in the NFL. And, and we're, um, uh, we're, you know, they're, they're both great. No, no need to, you yeah. know, I mean, they're both awesome period. <clears throat> the truth about LSU is that their schedule isn't that bad either. You know, um, the USC and UCLA is kind of weird. Uh, but they at least they get one on a neutral, and you might even go to that game from what you're talking about. And not, not, got, if, not if it's the price that you told me. To <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, uh, you you hit those tables hard, baby. Uh, UCLA <laughs> uh, is the fourth week, but uh, UCLA is an afterthought. You know, the tough one is uh, Ole Miss at A and M, Alabama, and at Florida. But you know. To, I don't see a ton of losses on this schedule. I can I can see nine to nine and a half wins. What do you have? So I, I marked them six and zero oh, uh, with with six uh, swing games, um, but they are favored by ten at South Carolina. So I'm going to give them a W there. So let's make that seven and zero. Oh. And I probably shouldn't just pencil in a W against USC. And the reason I say that is because LSU has lost four straight. 
uh, season openers, and I have been on them in the last three and lost a small fortune in both those FSU games and the uh, UCLA game back in uh, 2021. Not not sure either team's got many players left um, uh, from those previous coaching regimes, but um, if LSU does, th- those guys are looking for revenge. Um, but look, I, I've got a swing game uh, for Ole Miss. Now, that's a good spot for LSU. They've got two weeks to prepare, uh, whereas – Ole Miss does not. Um, but now the tricky game for LSU, you might, I might surprise people by saying I've got this as a swing game, is that at Arkansas. And I say that because all four of the previous meetings between LSU and Arkansas have been decided by exactly three points. And the last trip to Fayetteville was a very cold day. LSU won 13-10, to 10, but K.J. Jefferson was out uh, with a neck injury, and Arkansas definitely wins that game if K.J. – Uh, had been healthy, and Arkansas gets two weeks to prepare for that, and LSU is coming off the Ole Miss game and, you know, is possibly still undefeated at that point. Um, You know, right now, um, we we can say clearly, because LSU is minus two and a half or three against Ole Miss at most uh, books and games of the year, that they are definitely going to be favored in their first – six games. So obviously they could potentially be six and zero, oh, and going into Arkansas where, you know, they haven't had an easy game with Arkansas in the last four years. Um, and look that Taylor green kid, we'll, we'll talk about him, you know, if we get to Arkansas in a bit, but, um, that guy is dangerous. Um, so look, the, obviously those three, um, October games are all potentially losable. Obviously, Alabama at home is the same. And I know it's when Florida is going through a murderer's row in in their last five games of the year. But I don't think that Florida is going to be easy for them. Um, I do think they'll beat Oklahoma at home, but it's not a layup. So, um, you know, I've got seven games I I think LSU is going to win. And then it's five, you know, where, you know, they could go either way. Let's say they go three and two in those, then they're going to have an outstanding year. But I don't know that they're going to go uh, three and two of those. And the reason why is because that defense was so bad last year and they got a lot of those guys uh, are back this year. And Kelly did not uh, do as well in the portal um, as he has been doing. As they, 56. You know, he ranks 56 on that. Yes. So, I mean, they um, – they have been like in the top five of transfer specific. Uh, they're they're ranked 40th at 247 Sports, and that's just who the M coming guys coming in are, not not who they lost via the portal. So the defense worries me, but I do like Nuss, and, and there's they'll still be okay at wide receiver despite losing the first round picks, and they're probably going to have the best offensive line in the country. Two first round picks at the offensive tackle position. Well, you know. It- I think this is another schedule that works out. What's funny is I, I look at the bottom of these teams, uh, bottom of the SEC, and I'm like feeling sorry for their schedules. But no Georgia, no Texas, no Tennessee, no Missouri, and they both get Bama and Ole Miss at home. It's all it's going to be those weird little uh, road games, like you mentioned, at Arkansas, at A and M, at Florida. You know, it, it's those games that's going to be bothersome. Um, right. So, you know, and those do get in the way. These could be some good fade spots after they come up with a nice win um, in a letdown spot. I think this is the letdown schedule. You're just going to have to find them as a dog um, in some of those locations. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a letdown schedule, but I do have them probably going over nine games. Uh, Finally, Tennessee here for the power teams, really, and then we can kind of – well, I guess you Oklahoma, but Tennessee, you know, you got – Nico Iamaleva, I don't even know. It's hard to pronounce his name, kind of like good old Tua, right? Uh, I think it's Iamalieva, Iamalieva or something. I'm just going to call him Nico, all right? You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I learned how to say and spell Tonga Viola and Nui Matalolo uh, and Ui Ungalele, but for now, it's still just Nico for me. But I, in, sept, in September, when I hear his name called by the announcers a lot, I will get it down, Pat, and I will be able to spell it. Uh, but as for now, it is just Nico. All right, fair enough. Well, Tennessee, you know, I have them power rated just with LSU at 17 points better than the average team. But, uh, you know, returning production did not rank well on Tennessee, mostly because the quarterback's gone. But 108th, 
50% on offense, 47% on defense. Portal rankings, 35th, still not like SEC caliber. Net yards per play was huge at 1.5. Uh, win totals, eight and a half. This is another team that I'm leaning over. And it's just, you know, hypo, Hypo's going from not having a good quarterback in Milton to having a pretty good quarterback from what I saw so far with Nico. The problem is, is that that stout defense only returns a few starters. You know, so I am worried about that. Um, they have a really good defensive end there. Uh, Pierce. That I, yes, Pierce. Yeah, he's James gonna be Pierce. probably a top 10 pick uh next year if everything you know goes like we like we assume. But the schedule is decent. Uh, and um, once again, let me say this: no Ole Miss, uh, no Missouri and Texas at Oklahoma at or at Oklahoma at Georgia and home versus Alabama is the rough games. But, you know, they do get the bottom part of the SEC, I think. Um, they also have Van they have Vanderbilt, Kentucky, UTEP, Florida, if you want to throw them in the bottom. Uh, and uh, it, we'll, we'll see what you think about them. But Mississippi State's at home. Kentucky's at home. So, you know, I, I have another team that should get nine wins this year and be arguing to make the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, you look at the schedule and really the only game where you, you see that there'll be a significant underdog uh, is at Georgia. Um, I think they are like a two-point dog at home to Bama in games of the year, but I, I could be mistaken on that. Um, I think they're a three-and-a-half-point dog at Oklahoma. Um, they're around a four- to five-point favorite uh, against NC State and Charlotte. Um, so... But, I mean, everything else is winnable. I, I've seen them favored anywhere from 9 to 11 against Florida. Uh, but, you know, um, you know, they're they're still Florida's bitch. <laughs> Florida's <laughs> bitch, I love it. All right, we're seeing a time. Let's kind of do a little bit more rapid fire here. Because, um, you know, there's a lot of SEC teams, and we already went for uh, – I want to talk a little UFC at the end. That's why. So, sure. what about what about Oklahoma? What, what What's your outlook on them real quick? Yeah, so I, I lean under. I, I haven't played it, but, um, you know, at Auburn, I think it's kind of a toss-up. You know, they're going to be dogs to Texas. I'm going to say they lose that one. I definitely think they lose at Ole Miss. Ole Miss has got two weeks to prepare. Oklahoma, you know, has been – it'll be playing its third conference game in three weeks. I think they're going to lose at Missouri, and I think they're going to lose at LSU. But I will concede that – I haven't watched a lot of Jackson Arnold. I know he was a five-star coming out of high school. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm going to go – I'm not, you know, saying – I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I, I don't want to have a strong opinion on Oklahoma until I see more of Jackson Arnold uh, in the fire, you know, against live bullets. And But I just I, I think the schedule is brutal. I mean, at Auburn, they could, I mean, they could lose to Tennessee at home. Um and hey, uh, Tulane's not going to be easy at home in week three. Tulane almost beat them in Michael Pratt's uh, debut in 2021. They had the ball in Oklahoma territory, down five in the final minute as a 32-point underdog. And although I, I like Willie Fritz, who went to Houston, um, I love John Summerall, who uh, came from Troy and is Tulane's new coach. I have seven and a half wins. Um, I don't like Brett Venables as much as I thought I would when he was hired. I think uh, losing uh, uh, their offense coordinator was big to Mississippi State. Seth Luttrell's coming in, who played for the Sooners and was on Bob Stoops' uh, national title team in 2000. You know, he's coming in from, what, North Texas? Um, <laughs> I think it's, a, it's just a big downgrade, you know? Uh, I think that Jeff Levy was what they were last year. I, I don't see a lot of good offense in that quarterback. Jackson Arnold did not play well in the bowl game against Arizona, you know? So but that's kind of what I'm basing it off of. Cause I didn't think he looked good in that game. That's really the only, only time that I've seen him play. And uh, let me say one more thing and then I'll uh, shoot it back your way. I will say I do like their DC hire and Zach Alley. Cause I watched a lot of rich rod in Jacksonville state in those midweek games last year. This guy is Zach Ely Alley. I'm sorry. Is, is very young and very aggressive. He, he brings blitzes all over the place. And uh, I think he will be good for that defense. 
Well, it's still Venable's defense. Sure. So, you know, I mean, I guess he can add some thoughts to it. But when it comes to a defensive-minded coach, I usually look to the offense coordinator for the offensive-minded coach. I look to the defensive coordinator. So um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say under eight, lean. I'm going to lean it, but I'm, I, I'm really close to betting this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive in a little bit more. And, and this is and – A&M is another team with kind of like a honeymoon year with a new coach here in Mike Elko. He definitely steps up from Duke to uh, Texas A&M, but this is another team – that you know doesn't look that solid on the offense. They are always were great recruiting team, but they just go back. I don't think Elko can put it together quick enough. They have a really tough start against Notre Dame, then McNeese State's almost like a bye, and then at Florida. I, I mean, it, it's tough for the Aggies, and I only I, I still have them with eight wins, but I, I mean that's right around their total anyway. Yeah, I lean under on this one, and it's nothing against Elko. I mean, I thought what he did at Duke in a two-year stretch was uh, almost as uh, awesome as what James Franklin did at Vandy in a three-year stretch. The biggest thing for this team is Connor Wigman's got to stay healthy because he's got a 16-2 to career TDI and T ratio, but coming off that season-ending injury in late uh, September, um, and, uh, you know, they lost some guy. I mean, Evan Stewart, uh, that's a huge loss. Um, but their d- defense defense should be pretty good. They were pretty good last year. Uh, just didn't get much help from the offense. Um, but I, I'm an under uh, with A&M. Like you said, the Notre Dame game, week one's big. I think they're going to lose at Florida, even though they're favored by four. Um, I, like I said, I think they're going to lose at home to Missouri when it's an advantageous spot for the Tigers. Um, even when they go at South Carolina, South Carolina's got two weeks to prepare and A&M plays LSU the week before they're minus two at Auburn. Um, they're plus four against Texas. I just think there's a lot of losables out there and, uh, under eight and a half. Uh, I like this one. All right. So under eight and a half, that's, uh, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I agree with you. Um, Connor Wigman is just a China doll there. Uh, they do have a, a great schedule, no Georgia, no Bama, no Miss, Missouri and LSU's at home, but it, it's that honeymoon year. And what's really funny and fun, and this story should be bigger right now than I'm hearing, is Riley Leonard, his old quarterbacks, playing him that first week in Notre Dame. I think that's fun. That's a great story, isn't it? And I don't know how healthy is Leonard. Do we know he's going to be healthy in week one? I mean, he did have ankle surgery late spring. So that's another key. I do have A&M winning that game, but, um, you know, we'll see if Riley Leonard is, is, is going to be a hundred percent by then. I do not have A&M winning that game. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I just want to, just want to throw it out there, but let's talk a little bit about Florida, my friend. And, uh, I know you can go on for days. I'm not going to do it. Not going to do that. And Billy Napier. But all I have to say is a few things. Four and a half is too freaking low. It is. And now I didn't take it yet. I'm going to hunt around a little bit. And, you know, I'm starting to like have more bets than I want to make. But dude, four and a half is damn right disrespectful. And they rank 24th in returning production. Their recruiting is always there. You know, they're the number two team in booster money. I noticed It, it was like, I think it was number two. It was definitely top five. I was shocked. That, that the Gators had so much booster money. I, I I probably should have talked to you more about that. I mean, no, they were no good last year, minus 0.8 net yards per play, but they ranked 19th on the on three uh, net portal ratings. 4.5, man. I know their schedule is super hard, but Graham freaking Mertz through 73% completion. Now, maybe there were some short passes and maybe he didn't always make the big play, but only three interceptions there. Um, it, I feel like Graham Mertz could be an NFL quarterback with how he looks and how he throws the ball. He could just be like not great for college. Maybe one of those that's better than like a Jalen Milrow for the NFL itself. You know, that's kind of what I think. Um, if a few of these transfers hit, yeah, I, I think Florida could be creepy, man. I, I, sneaking up on people. I think they could get to six wins. Now, maybe you're hoping they don't so Napier can get canned. <laughs> <laughs> so I, as a fan, I know what you're talking about. I've been in those shoes many times, my man. But I'm going to go over four and a half at some point. I just don't know. Why. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, a holy buy low opportunity here. I mean, this is the second year in a row we've had our lowest season win total in program history, and it's understandable. Billy Napier is 7-14 and 14, uh, against Power 5 opponents during his uh, tenure at Florida. Every move, every decision, and every result has been complete dog shit, and, uh, except for one, except for one. And I, I got to call myself out if I'm going to call Napier out. I got to call myself out. I was on your show. I was on a bunch of shows last summer talking about what a disgraceful decision it was to bring in Graham Mertz as your starting QB. And Graham Mertz was awesome. Now, you know, there were a lot of short passes, so the completion percentage is maybe a, a little deceiving. But, hey, he should have only had one interception last year. Two of his interceptions hit the guys right on the hands and or the numbers. Um, and – he got the season in injury against Missouri in what was just probably the best play of his career. He literally ran over two people twice on the play to get the first down on a third, like in five. And, uh, he, he was so fired up, he got up doing his fist, not even realizing he had broke his collarbone on the play. <laughs> so Graham Mertz was not Florida's problem last year. I think Florida will be better. But the schedule is brutal. Uh, I agree on over four and a half, and I like them plus three or maybe plus two and a half against Miami in week one. And uh, the one spot, and I think it's the six or anywhere in the five and a half, six and a half range. Um, when they play LSU at home, uh, they are starving to beat LSU, have lost some. Um, well, we've lost five in a row against them, and four of them were uh, pretty bad heartbreakers. Yeah, in, in in during that stretch, Georgia at Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, and at Florida State, they're going to get somebody, if not two teams during, during that stretch. I don't know who it's going to be and at what time. But, you know, Florida State's also in a lot of questions. I mean, they're, they're, they're supposed to be the best team in the ACC maybe, but it, it, they still are relying on a ton of transfers. from. And I don't like DJU that much, to be honest. Me so, neither. So, you know, that's a possible win. Um, it. Yeah, Ole Miss at home, LSU at home, at Texas is tough, but versus Georgia is always, you know, it, look, you know, um, they're gonna they're gonna win five or six games. I, I like this over four and a half. Shop around to find the juice. I mean, it's it's already minus one fifty, whatever. The books don't want you to bet it. That's because of the numbers there. They're showing it out there. But yeah, I'm with you on that. All right, rapid what, fire, what, man. Wait, 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 one last thing on Florida. 17 and 2 in the last 19 head to head meetings against Tennessee. We call Neyland Stadium the Swamp North. Do not just pencil in a guaranteed L when Florida goes at Tennessee on October 12th. The Swamp North. Reminds me of Wrigley North up in uh, Milwaukee, my friend. Um, Auburn. I mean, I think I have Auburn actually somewhat improved from last year. Uh, I have them. Uh, seven wins. I still think their win total is a little too high. I mean, I, I don't know how a team. Uh, I think last year they had some weird. They beat like Ole Miss and uh, and they lost to New Mexico State. No, they, they beat they beat Arkansas. They beat Mississippi State. Um, and then uh, they lose to New Mexico State by 10 and 31. And if you want to talk about Vanderbilt, they're, they're pretty much the new New Mexico state from last year, but uh, I, I have seven wins for Auburn and uh, Hugh freeze. Yeah. I, I think they're, they're six and six or seven and five. They're going to be good at wide receiver. Um, Hugh freeze is Diego Pavia's uh, bitch. New Mexico <laughs> state has beaten him uh, by in blowouts as heavy underdogs uh, the last uh, two years. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say six and six or seven and five for Auburn. Can't believe freeze did not go get a veteran out of the portal, uh, to compete with Peyton Thorne at quarterback. All right. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Kentucky, I have them at six and a half wins along with the market, but they do rank 14th in returning production. I wrote down tricky schedule. They have to go to Ole Miss, Tennessee, Texas, and Florida. The Louisville game is still a threat at the end, especially with a Jeff Brom Louisville. I know they they're you know, Louisville's their bitch, but you know that's it, still it's their Louisville's getting better. Uh, new OC Bush Hamden from Boise State will have his work cut out in the SEC, uh, and uh, five star Georgia transfer Brock Vandegrift at quarterback. You know, it, 
I, I, I find it hard to really rank a lot of these transfers. Remember the five star out of Georgia that that Hunter something that played for Northwestern and couldn't even throw a freaking pass 10 yards. You know, it's just, I, I, I'm tough. I, I don't know what to think of Brock Vandegrift, but I can't, I, I don't think it's going to be that good. Well, <clears throat> you know, no shame in being behind two time natty winner Stetson Bennett and Carson Beck, who's going to be a top 10 uh, pick. I, I, you know, there, it's a small sample size, but if you watch what little film there is available, and I'm just talking about doing a Twitter search and, and go to media, and he's got an absolute cannon. He's got really good receivers. Um, I think Kentucky's going to be pretty good, but like you were saying, like they're not going to win at Ole Miss. They're not going to win at Tennessee when Tennessee's got two weeks to prepare and they're playing a fourth game in four weeks. They're not going to win at Texas. So I've got them six and four with two swing games being at Florida and Auburn at home. I'll say they lose at Florida and beat Auburn and go seven and five. But they they could sneak up on somebody. Oh, and the fourth loss was going to be Georgia at home. Um, yeah. So I, I got them going seven and five. All right. What about Shane Beamer in the game Cox? I would almost assume that that place would get a lot of Florida alumni playing there, but um, you know, it, they're not playing Florida this year. So, I mean, I, I still think the cupboard is bare. What about you? Yeah. I mean, I just, I worry about them at the quarterback uh, position. I mean, Lenora Sellers is only a three star coming out of high school. Now I've, maybe he'll be end up, end up being really good. I, I don't know. I haven't really seen him. Uh, at all uh, is Rocket Sanders going to be healthy? I mean, good get as a transfer from Arkansas, but um, the, the win total is five and a half. I like it under. Um, I think this could be a four and eight team, maybe five and seven, but we'd still be okay uh, with under five and a half. I also have it at four and a half wins, where they, they I don't see them getting to five. So I would I'd be with you on under five and a half. I mean, losing that quarterback Spencer Rattler. Is tough, and he didn't have no time to throw the ball. Imagine what uh, uh, what's his face is going to do. I forgot the name of Sellers. Sellers. Lenora right? Sellers. Sellers. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what Lenora Sellers is going to do. Um, Dow Loggins continuing at OC there. Ugh. Um, the defense front def decided to show up a little bit at the end. I will give them credit for a couple wins there. I mean, it was Jacksonville State, Vanderbilt, and Kentucky. So it's like, <laughs> how much credit? How much credit should I be giving them? But no. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is an under for sure. Uh, what about Arkansas? Now you did say Taylor green out of, uh, transferring out of Boise state there. Now, Arkansas, um, I'm still not, you know, uh, I'm not convinced. I, I have them very low power rated for an sec team, but at the same time, so does, uh, a lot of power ratings. Um, what is, I'm just going to look up what, uh, 5.8 points better than the average team is what team rankings has and ESPN's FPI has them at 4.6 better. I, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm at three. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not big on this team until I see it. And I know Taylor Green's decent, but this just, it's a hogs team that lost a lot of players themselves. What about you? Well, they did lose five one possession games uh, last year. Uh, Taylor Green is a, a lot bigger guy than I think, people realize he is 6'6", uh, 225. He's got breakaway speed. And Bobby Petrino is the new OC. I love Luke Haas, uh, the rising sophomore tight end who was really starting a ball when he got that season-ending injury at, at LSU in October. Um, Andrew Armstrong's a big-time uh, receiver. But you know, you look at the schedule, and I love Sam Pittman, and I hope he, he wins six and gets retained. Um, but I got a feeling we could see Bobby Petrino as the interim, uh, head coach late in the year. And, uh, if he can pull an upset at home against Texas or at Missouri, maybe they keep him, but I think, uh, most likely they, they go four and eight and Rhett Lashley at SMU is going to be their next head coach. That's what I would, uh, predict, but I hope I'm wrong. I hope Pittman wins six because I like Sam Pittman. I wrote Bobby Petrino comes back to this team with a neck brace and a new motorcycle. Uh, the problem is that going through the SEC again, he might 
need that neck brace and possibly a full body cast this time. Did he get his ass kicked by that girl's boyfriend or, or was yes. that a motorcycle? Yes. It, it, it was, was not a, a motor. Yeah, okay. It's not a motorcycle accident. The, 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 the rashes on his face was, uh, he was getting, he was being given dirt snuggles or, 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 you know, concrete licks. Uh, yeah, he got his ass beat by the fiance. <laughs> God, I wish I, I would have saw that. All right. Mississippi state. Um, very, I'm low on this team, man. I'm pretty yes. dang low on them. I, I think they're, you know, starting to get into Vanderbilt uh, culture here. <laughs> it just has not been good. I'm going to be honest with you. I have them at minus two points worse than the average team. They only rank 116th in returning production. New coach, Jeff Levy, comes in from the OC at Oklahoma, but there's no true starters returning. You know, it's just very few. I think there's one. Is there no zero on offense that was a true starter, I think? Um, depends what magazine you might look at, but uh, just a couple on defense. Uh, I guess you win the easy non-con games. Do you win at ASU? Uh, Toledo, probably a win. Eastern Kentucky, probably a win. But I don't see another win in the schedule until they play freaking UMass. Dude, I, this is a bad team. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess – if we're being optimistic for them, maybe there's six winnable games. Uh, you know, Eastern Kentucky at Arizona State, Toledo and Florida at home, Arkansas at home, and UMass at home. So I'm not saying take under three and a half. Well, the, I'm not saying take over at a minus 184 price, which is what I see at FanDuel. It's going to be a rough year one uh, for Mr. Jeff Lebby. Uh, but the uh, season win total is a pass for me. I think if he goes five and seven, uh, he will have done a good job. If he goes six and six, he, he might should be in the running. Well, actually, because they are six one, he shouldn't be in the running for coach of the year. But that would be a very um, thumbs up to Jeff Lebby if he gets this team to a bowl game. Now for Vanderbilt, I upgraded them from minus nine to minus four and a half in my power ratings. Now they return. 57 is what they rank, 60% on offense, 69% on defense returning. They're actually 36th in the on-net transfer portal. For them, probably not bad. Uh, minus 1.8 net yards per play was terrible. Their win total is three. I have Vanderbilt winning three and a half games. Now, I, I wrote that it, it appears Clark Lee is turning uh, Vanderbilt into New Mexico State, as I alluded before. Jerry Kill is there as an analyst, right? Uh, you got New Mexico State's offensive coordinator, Tim Beck. You know, he's in. Uh, Diego Paeva, like you said, uh, coming on in and beating Auburn the way he does. Uh, the dude ran like a 10-5, I hear, in his high school 100-yard dash. So this, this Diego Paeva is fast. I mean, I liked him. and They won 10 games last year at New Mexico State. And I mean, I almost feel like Vanderbilt is New Mexico State now, kind of like Indiana is James Madison. So I'm yep. like, maybe I should just give them what I would think of New Mexico State with a couple also additions. I think you might see an improved Vanderbilt team. Diego Pavia is an absolute badass, but he's going to be running for his life. Um, they lost, like, with the exception of De De Ricky Wright and um, – Langston Patterson, uh, I mean, they lost, and, you know, Quincy Skinner's a, a pretty decent wide receiver, um, but they lost all their best players. All their best players hit the portal. Um, now, good get with Pavia. Uh, they, they had a few pretty good gets uh, in the portal, but Clark Lee's not going to survive this year. They might win. I mean, they should beat Alcorn State, obviously. They should beat Ball State. Um, well, they should beat Georgia State, too. Sure, sure. That's sure. three wins right there. And then South Carolina is kind of, hmm, you know, um, everything else sucks. I guess at Kentucky is a, a shot, a, a small shot, but everything else is a loss. But you just need four, you know, to go over that number. Um, I, it's look, it's three, really. It's three. You can push at three. Yeah. Uh, Fandle's got two and a half, but minus 200 to the over. Look, I, the only bet I like – the only bet I like with these guys is I like Vatek. Anything 14 or fewer is an absolute gift. I'm really high on Virginia. I know we don't have time to talk about it, but I'm real high on Virginia Tech this year. Yeah, I'm high on Virginia Tech too. I'm not touching that first game. Um, I, Not on Vanderbilt's side. Virginia Tech, maybe. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, that's what okay. I said. I, I, did I 
I said I like the Hokies. I don't know if I said that right. 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 No, you oh, did. You right. did. You All were right. correct there too, because I think the Hokie. I think I think power rating wise, I have Virginia Tech uh, at least seventeen points better uh, than them. Um, yeah, yeah. I have a I have a good amount better than Vanderbilt. All right. Well, let's. We we went an hour and nine minutes. We always go long, but I still have to talk a little UFC. We have to put a few minutes away for that, but baby, because this is actually a good event. You know, yeah. the last few events have not been good. Um, not since UFC 300. UFC 300 was just utter badassness with with uh so um, was 299. Yeah, 299 was awesome too. Absolutely, but but nothing um you know compares to that middleweight fight uh with uh my man. Oh god, what I'm I'm losing it. when he fought Gaethje, when he knocked Gaethje out right in the middle oh, of the Holloway. Ring. Holloway Max yes, Holloway. Max amazing. Holloway. Yeah, dude, that was the that was the best. <laughs> Thing I've seen great. a long time. That was amazing. Well, you got the Wild Muhammad versus Leon Edwards. These guys fought a while ago, and there was an eye poke there. And I remember watching this and Bilal's big old eye. I remember how he was sitting down and just I, I thought he was getting his butt kicked personally. And he was getting his butt kicked. Now, don't get me wrong, the dude got better. He's beaten Luke, he's beaten Steven Thompson. Gilbert Burns, I think, was a pretty good win for him. I think he's kind of hit his peak, but I think Leon Edwards' peak is a as a level above him, Leon Edwards being Colby Covington, Kamaru Usman, who is an amazing fighter, it, it, strength to schedule Leon Edwards. I mean, Leon Edwards, I think, is going to win this fight. I just don't know if it's going to be within five rounds or not. I think Bilal Muhammad is last, and I do see Leon Edwards going to round five the last four freaking times. Uh, you know, he went to decision, but you have to understand one was Nate Diaz, one was Kamaru Usman, and one was Colby Covington. I think he might be able to finish Bilal Muhammad. So, you know, I, I, I'm trying to, in my mind, uh, put this together. I, I think he's a parlay piece. What about you? Yeah, I, I'm not against Leon Edwards uh, in a parlay, but I must warn uh, folks that uh, I've been uh, I've been on the other side of Bilal, three of his last four fights, and, and taking L's and backing Wonderboy, Vicente Luque, and Gilbert Burns now. Gilbert Burns threw his shoulder out in round one. And so, you know, we, we don't really know who would have won that fight if Burns doesn't get hurt. But, I mean, I think he got hurt defending a takedown. So maybe you just give, give Bilal credit for that. But um, so I'm fine with a parlay with Edwards and Aspinall. Um, I got to do a little more of a deep dive on the prelims to maybe find that third parlay piece. Because, um, but my favorite pick of the night, and this is my favorite pick of any card Tom Aspinall is on until somebody survives round one. And right now I'm looking at FanDuel. Um, Tom Aspinall to win in round one is plus 130 against Curtis Blades in the co-main event. Uh, and I also like Aspinall to win by a KO, TKO, which you can get at minus 120 uh, at FanDuel. Um, I, I, I don't know that John Jones will survive round one with Tom Aspinall and until what? somebody survi survives round one against Tom Aspinall. I'm on Tom Aspinall to win in round one every single time he steps into the octagon. Oh my God. You're, this is kind of like, uh, getting into Kamzat Chimayev, Chimayev like area here. Uh, dude, um, I mean. He's really stepped. I mean, he broke his leg against Blades last time. You know, right. I was on Aspen all that fight, and I had a way freaking better number than I have now. And right. it's very, it's very depressing to lose that because of a of a broken leg. And now you have to uh, minus three ninety is just freaking outrageous, man. I, I, it's very disrespectful to Curtis Blades. Now, is Curtis Blades done? I mean, is he just showing up now for paychecks? I don't know. Um, he is kind of, you know. A little bit old, old in the tooth there, isn't he? Long in the tooth. I'm, I'm trying to say. Well, look, Blades took my money at UFC 300 uh, when I had my um, uh, Jailton Almeida guy, who I was super duper high on, until he wouldn't let go of that takedown and let Blades hit him with like eight Travis Brown elbows to uh, to uh, oh our guy, um, God, the guy who used to be so juiced up. I don't know why I'm blanking on him. Pavlovich? Uh, no, he beat he beat Brock Lesnar with that leg kick to the liver. Oh my God! I cannot believe I'm. Uh, he's from Amsterdam. Oh my God! He's retired now. I, don't, I can't believe I can't think of his, the Reem over Reem. Alistair over Reem. Oh, Travis over Brown him. when Brown beat over Reem with those elbows. That's what Blades did to Almeida. Um, 
But anyway, back to Aspinall. Um, he has fought 17 times in his career, and only, uh, or let's see, every single one of his wins in his entire career has come in round one, except for Andrea Arlovsky, who lasted a minute nine into round two. Um, so that's just kind of showing the the evidence, if you will, of uh, my thoughts on plus 130 for Aspinall to win in round one. Yeah, um, you know, I just the Ser, the Sergey Pavlovich was finally the guy that kind of was 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 opens up him to the blades and to the well uh, John Jones I guess or uh, Volkov type fighters right the big guys the 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 the, the number one in the uh, tier one I would say I like to put my fighters in tiers. But it's just that Blades has just fought in so much of a of a better schedule, and now you're sitting. But I mean, if I'm li- if I'm lining this, I, I'm making Tom about minus two fifty, minus two. I mean, minus three ninety almost makes me want to take Blades at plus two ninety, just numbers wise. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it, Kiev. It's an L. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, all right. Curtis, Curtis Blades is not <laughs> winning this fight, brother. It's not happening. He has no path to victory. He is going to get KO'd inside of two minutes. What about Patty the Batty against King Green? You know, I think that's a tough handicap, in my opinion. Um, yeah, toss up Green's fight, fair. in my opinion. Barely. I used to hate Patty, but but I mean, just think he's just you know way overrated. But the dude sure. got better. He got better. I gotta give him credit. He got better and better since that one fight that he almost dropped. Um, I I think that I've seen a lot of good improvement in him. Um, he better was, wrestle. Was Gordon, I think. It, it was Gordon. Yeah, Jared. It was yeah, Gordon. Jared Gordon. Yeah, he, it, hey, it was he, Jared Gordon. Yeah, he bet. He bet. Patty better wrestle Bobby. I think he'll get pieced up on the feet, but I think Patty can out grapple him and probably got a little more muscle than him in the clinch and, and all that. Um, Bobby's got nine submissions, 11 KOs, 12 decisions and nine submissions, man. That's that, I didn't that, know Bob. Wow. Yeah. That surprises me. Well, he got the submission against uh, Ferguson. Um, yeah. Yeah. Know. Yeah. He knows how to do it, but he'd rather be on it. You know, he'd rather be on his feet. Yeah, I that, think back not, in the, back, back in the day, he used to submit people back in 2012, 13. Yeah, that shocks yeah. me that he's got nine subs. This is a good gateway fight. I think this is one I'm just going to enjoy. Me too. Um, because I'm because I still. Why would I go against Patty, or why would I bet on Patty now when I've kind of my always thought he was a little overrated? Now he steps up and I lose my bet. I would be kicking the crap out of myself after that. Right. But but at the same time, I, Bobby. Green is a king is a placeholder. I'm not seeing a over under. Um, I I think this fight probably goes the distance, but I'm not seeing a price. Oh wait, wait, here a fight. To go, no, I'm not seeing a it's, price. It's a I'm little gonna... early on a Monday, right? Um, wait, 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 wait. Uh, there it is. Over two and a half minus one. <laughs> oh yeah, minus... no. You're about minus one sixty on the to go to decision there. Yeah. Not not gonna lay that that kind of price. I was hoping it would be around minus one ten or even money or even plus, and then I would think about that. But I'm just gonna enjoy that one, same as you. What about Christian Leroy Duncan versus Robocop Gregory Rodriguez? Uh this is close to I mean what's funny, Rodriguez is plus one fifteen here and and Duncan is minus one thirty five. Um I didn't look much at this yet, but I I'm, I would lean Rodriguez right now until I dive into it a little bit more. Yeah, um, I uh, I might would look under there, but um, I need to do a little more. I mean, I'm familiar with Rodriguez. I um, I would need to study uh, Christian Leroy Duncan uh, a little better before I gave an opinion to your audience. He got he gets caught sometimes. You know, he got caught against uh, Bruno Ferreira. Um, his wins are Chitty. Chitty was a good win, I thought, but I thought Chitty was kind of beating him up until he got caught a little bit. Robocop's a little bit slow, but he's powerful. Um, I think he's in the same corner as Adesanya. I think there's uh, both, um, is it Killcliffe? Uh, at least they were. Christian Louis Roy Duncan, God, I've seen him. The problem is he's British and it's going to be a home 
you know, right. Field, I ne or, never know with the decision game. there. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I, yeah. I, are you seeing an over under? Um, yeah, it is under. Uh, ooh, they no, never mind. I have all of them in the fights that Rodriguez, yep, yep, one for one and a half plus 105. So you, you don't get much past even money for under one and a half in this. Yeah, I, I would lean under one and a half, but I wouldn't risk much at all. Yeah, because Duncan has been going into the second round and the third round. Yeah. He's beaten a lot of guys in the first that were just garbage, you know. Um, and Rod, likes Rodriguez knocks people out 10, th three submissions, two decisions. He went to the third round with Brad, Brad Tavares. Uh, this, I could see this going over possibly too, but I would lean under, but, you know, I could see it going over. Well, let's look at the last fight on the main card then. Uh, or the first, well, the first fight, Arnold Allen versus Giga Chikadze. And Giga is also from uh, Europe and from London, I believe. Uh, Giga is a favorite. Oh, no, he's a dog, plus 210. And Arnold Allen is minus 260. I was on Giga for a while, then he then he disappointed me by losing to somebody. I have to pull it up. But um, right now, I have no opinion. And uh, But Giga's got a really fat plus 210 price on him. Cater, Calvin Cater was the um, one he disappointed you, I'm guessing. Um, I, you know, Jakatse, um, I, I mean, plus 200 is tempting. Uh, I think it's Jikatsu. He's from Georgia, by the way. I just want to fix that. He's from Georgia. The yep, flag yep. looks the same. My bad. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's Jakatse or pass. I definitely could not lay that kind of price with Allen, especially coming off back-to-back -back losses uh, like he is. So uh, I'm not saying I'm definitely going to bet it. But uh, I mean, now I, I say Arnold's coming off back-to-back -back losses. He's coming off losses, decision losses to two absolute monsters. So um, I shouldn't say it in that uh, negative uh, of a fashion. Um, you know, uh, his last loss was to an 18 and 0 guy, and the other one was to yeah, Max Holloway. Yeah. So, Max Holloway, yeah, that's pretty yeah, okay. So <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I, I did not mean to be so harsh with that assessment, but I still think, I think it's Chikats. Go ahead. Yeah. I agree. I think it's Chicago. I mean, here's the thing. I'd be scared to put Allen in my parlay with Edwards. You know, yep. it'd be kind of like, God, I can see Giga doing this one and winning this one. Giga does have more significant strikes landed per minute. Um, he does get taken down a bit. So I think Allen could win that way too, though. But Allen gives up four inches to Giga, you know, five, eight to six foot tall, um, four inches of reach. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's, it's just too big of a price. So um, maybe Allen by sub, maybe you can get a prop on that. Um, Giga only Giga's only three losses is being subbed um, and by decision, subbed once and decision twice. And Allen has seven KOs, four subs, and eight decisions. So this could also go decision. Okay, probably staying away from it, but it's going to be a wonderful card this weekend, my man. No, no doubt. And, um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I look forward to Aspinall getting on that microphone and just saying, John Jones, quit dodging me. You chump. I will sleep you <laughs> in three minutes. Youngster or not youngster. He's the younger guy. What am I talking about? Um, yeah, but I, uh, Aspinall is going to win in round one. And then I hope he, Taunts John Jones is what I hope. Absolutely. Well, my man, we went a long time. It's been an hour and 23 minutes, but hey, we covered a hell of a lot of SEC, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. Really appreciate you, Brian. Where could our listeners get your wonderful information in place? Uh, well, is my um, Twitter handle on the screen? Uh, maybe not. Uh, at Vegas uh, B Edwards. And uh, you can find my content at majorwager.com and my picks uh, at vegasinsider.com. And um, once football season starts, I'll, I'll, I'll have my picks up at uh, brianedwardsports.com as well. Enjoyed it as always, uh, Kiev. And thanks, thank you for having me. All right, my man. Well, anytime. And we'll be having you on throughout the football season, Brian. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll be texting. All right, buddy. Thank you.